Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. If this is your first time, let me give you a quick rundown on what we're all about. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we build fun and inexpensive Focus Commander decks. A Focus Commander deck is more tuned than a casual deck, but not quite to the level of a competitive or optimized deck. Today's episode is going to be a special one, though, where we exclude the cost of the Commander. With just a $25 budget, it's pretty much impossible to build around some Commanders unless we do so. Plus, you could open up a Commander in a pack, or you could just trade for them if you really want to build around them. So our budget is still going to be $25, but again, that's $25 for a 99 card since we're excluding that Commander cost. A quick reminder that prices on this show are powered by our sponsor, TCG Player. Before we get started today, though, make sure you go check out our new Golden Pig playmat on thecommandersquarters.com. And thank you to everyone who's already purchased one. It really does help support the channel. Also, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell notification icon so you can stay up to date in the latest Commander's Quarters episodes. Today's commander is Reaper King. Reaper King is a 6-6 Scarecrow with a very complex mana cost. It costs 2 aura white, 2 aura blue, 2 aura black, 2 aura red, and 2 aura green. So depending on your mana situation, it can cost you anywhere from 5 to 10 mana total. It has other Scarecrow creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1, and whenever another Scarecrow comes into play under your control, destroy target permanent. Now Scarecrows aren't particularly a powerful tribe, but this effect is incredible. Being able to destroy any permanent whenever a Scarecrow comes into play is a huge effect. So what's our strategy for this deck? Well, we want to ramp quickly to set up and get the Reaper King out. Again, the Reaper King has a very constraining yet flexible mana cost where we can pay anywhere between 5 and 10 mana depending on our mana situation. So if we're able to fix our colors quickly, we're able to cast the Reaper King quickly. Also, there are plenty of artifact strategies that we're running in this deck and we can get those set up before we start casting our Scarecrows. And then how do we win with this deck? Well, we're going to cast, blink, and copy our Scarecrow army. Every single time one of our Scarecrows comes into play, we get to destroy any permanent on the field. We've got plenty of ways in this deck to abuse those triggers and to get more and more of them. At a certain point, we can even just start destroying our opponent's land so that there's no coming back for them. As with all Commander's Quarters decks, I'm going to take you through 10 different tactics that show you how the deck works and how you're going to win with it. So let's get started with our first tactic, tactic number one, Rocky Road. First up, there's Wayfarer's Bobble, which we can pay two to tap and sacrifice to search our library for a basic land to put into play tapped. And then there's Pillar of Origins, which when it enters the battlefield, we're going to choose Scarecrow so that we can tap to add one mana of any color to our mana pool as long as we're using that mana to cast a Scarecrow. Speaking of Scarecrows, there's Scuttlemutt, which will actually help us cast other Scarecrows because it can tap to add one mana of any color to our mana pool. And then we're going to be running all ten of the Signets, including Azorius, Demir, Rakdos, Gruul, Selesnya, Orzov, Izzet, Golgari, Boros, and Simic. These Signets come in huge when it comes to helping us cast the Reaper King because they can help us filter our mana. Next up there's Everflowing Chalice, which we can either cast early or we can save up some mana to cast it later. But whenever we cast it, it's going to tap for half the amount of mana that we put into it. And then there's Blink Moth Urn, which says at the beginning of each player's pre-combat main phase, if it's untapped, that player adds colorless for each artifact they control. We are running a ton of artifacts in this deck, and Blink Moth Urn comes in huge in helping us cast more and more of them. But ramping isn't the only way to help us cast our artifacts, so let's go on to some other ways in tactic number two, Trinkets on Sale. Ethereum Sculptor and Foundry Inspector aren't just artifact creatures, but they're also going to reduce the cost of artifact spells that we cast by one. Each and every single one of our Scarecrows in this deck is an artifact, so these cards come in huge. Another card with a similar effect is Joy Riz Familiar, which reduces the cost of historic spells that we cast, which are either artifacts, legendaries, or sagas. Now we don't have any sagas in this deck, but we do have a few legendary creatures in this deck outside of our commander. But again, the main reason that this is in the deck is to reduce the cost of all of our artifacts, including our Scarecrows. Alright, so we've talked about ramping and setting up some cards to help reduce the cost of our artifacts, but there are some other things that we can do to set up to make sure that we succeed with this deck. Let's go through some of those ways in tactic number three, something extra. First up, there's Padim, Console of Innovation, which has artifacts you control have hexproof, and at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control the artifact with the highest converted mana cost or tied for the highest converted mana cost, draw a card. So Padim serves a double purpose in this deck. Not only does he protect our artifacts, but he can also provide us with some card advantage. With the Reaper King in play alongside Padim, we're pretty much always going to be drawing a card during our upkeep since its converted mana cost is 10. And then we're going to be running some cards that help us with card selection. First up there's Artificer's Assistant, which says whenever you cast a Historic spell, scry 1. And then there's Riddlesmith, which says whenever you cast an Artifact spell, you may draw a card if you do discard a card. And with Quicksmith Genius in play, whenever an Artifact enters the battlefield under your control, you discard a card and then draw a card. So each of these cards goes about it in a different way, but again, we're going to be getting some good card selection whenever we cast an artifact. And again, since the vast majority of spells in this deck are artifacts, we're going to get plenty of value out of these cards. But perhaps the card that's going to provide us with the most value is Joyra Weatherlight Captain. 
Joyra says, whenever you cast a Soric spell, draw a card. So now instead of getting card selection whenever we cast an artifact, we're going to get card advantage. Joyra helps us draw into more and more scarecrows that we can cast to destroy more and more permanents. Now we've been talking a lot about those scarecrows, but we really haven't gotten to any yet. And it really wouldn't be much of a scarecrow tribal deck without them, so let's go on to tactic number four, cloth and straw. Now most tribal decks like elves, goblins, or any of the other popular tribes really have a lot of cards to pick from. But unfortunately for us, there are really only 31 actual scarecrows in magic. So we are going to be playing some less than optimal creatures in this deck, but again remember that with all those scarecrows stapled onto them as long as Reaper Kings in play is destroy target permanent when they enter the battlefield. So first up we've got Jawbone Skullkin, which is a 1-1 one, one for 1 that we can pay 2 to make target red creature gain haste until the end of the turn. Now we don't have too many red creatures in this deck, but we can give our commander haste with this card. And then there's Field Creeper, which is just a 2-1 for 2. Fang Skulkin is also a 2-1 for 2, but we can also give target black creature wither until the end of the turn by paying 2. And next up is Chainbreaker, which is a 3-3, but it enters the battlefield with 2 minus 1 minus 1 counters on it. We can pay 3 with it though to tap it to remove a minus 1 minus 1 counter from target creature. And then there's Pili Pala, which we can pay 2 to untap it to add 1 mana of any color to our mana pool. Now this effect generally doesn't come in handy for us, but again, it's just a Scarecrow for 2, so being able to destroy any permanent for just 2 mana is huge. And next up is Wicker Witch, which is just a 3-1 for 3. Lurebound Scarecrow has a much better body for its mana cost, but when it comes into play we have to choose a color, and when we control no permanence of the chosen color we have to sacrifice it. And then there's Tatterkite, which can't have any counters placed on it, but again we just care that it's a Scarecrow. Next up is Hoof Skulkin, which we can pay 3 to give target green creature plus 1 plus 1 until the end of the turn. And then there's Harvest Hand, which when it dies it transforms into Scrounge Scythe, which gives Equip Creature plus 1 plus 1. Next up is Watchwing Scarecrow, which has Vigilance as long as we control a white creature, and has Flying as long as we control a blue creature. And then there's Scrap Basket, which we can pay 1 to make it all colors until the end of the turn. Next up is Wicker Warcrawler, which starts off as a 6-6 six, six for 5 mana, but whenever it attacks or blocks we put a minus 1 minus 1 counter on it at the end of combat. And next up is Blazethorn Scarecrow, which has Haste as long as you control a red creature, and has Wither as long as you control a green creature. Finally, there's Thornwatch Scarecrow, which has Wither as long as you control a green creature, and it has Vigilance as long as you control a white creature. Again, as long as our commander's in play, it's going to fulfill all those color requirements for these types of cards. As I mentioned earlier, when you're running a tribe that doesn't have many creatures to pick from, there are going to be less than optimal choices. But all of these creatures become infinitely better if Reaper King is in play when they enter the battlefield. However, not all Scarecrows are bad, there are definitely some that are useful to us outside of destroying a permanent. Let's go through them now in tactic number 5, The Real Deal. First up there's Heap Doll, which has Sacrifice It, Remove Target Card, and Graveyard from the game. There are plenty of graveyard focused decks, and we can really throw a wrench into them just by removing one of their key cards from their graveyard. And then there's Wildfield Scarecrow, which we can pay 2 to Sacrifice It to search our library for up to 2 basic land cards and put them into our hand. This deck is primarily blue, but we do have splashes of other colors in there, and again, if we've got all 5 of our colors, we can cast Reaper King for cheaper. Next up is One-Eyed Scarecrow, which has Creatures with Flying Your Opponent's Control get minus 1, minus 0. This card can definitely come in handy against any decks that focus on flyers like the Locust God or Psy. And then there's Lockjaw Snapper, which has Wither, and when it's put into a graveyard from play, we put a minus 1, minus 1 counter on each creature with a minus 1, minus 1 counter on it. This is a pretty unique effect and it can come in handy in shrinking down some opponent's armies because we do have a couple of creatures that do have wither or can get it. And next up we're running three creatures that deal with persist. When a creature with persist is put into the graveyard, as long as it had no minus one minus one counters on it, it comes back into play with a minus one minus one counter on it. So as long as we control a black creature, wing rattle scarecrow and rattle blade scarecrow will both come back into play when they die. And then for just two mana we can give target white creature persist until the end of the turn with antler skulkin's ability. This can come in huge in helping us save the Reaper King. Another card that can help save the Reaper King is Shell Skulkin. By paying 3, we can give target blue creature Shroud until the end of the turn. Again, this deck is primarily blue, and we are running a decent amount of blue creatures outside of the Reaper King, like Joyra and Padim. And Shell Skulkin's ability really can come in handy at a pinch. So we've talked about all the Scarecrows that we're going to be using in this deck, but there are other cards that are kind of like Scarecrows. Let's talk about them now in Tactic Number 6, Intimidating Imitation. First up there's Moth Dust Changeling, which is a shapeshifter that has Changeling. Changeling means that this card is every creature type at all times. And because of this, that means that all creatures that have Changeling are also Scarecrows. So again, if Reaper King is in play, by casting Moth Dust Changeling for just one mana, we can destroy any target permanent. And then there's Torian Mauler, which is a threat on its own outside of just destroying a permanent. It has Changeling, and whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may put a plus one plus one counter on Torian Mauler. In a multiplayer format like Commander, this creature can get huge very quickly. And finally there's Changeling Berserker, which is another creature with Changeling, and it has Haste and Champion a creature. 
So when it comes into play, we have to sacrifice it unless we remove another creature we control from the game, and then when it leaves play, that card returns to play. Now usually this would be seen as a downside since we have to temporarily get rid of one of our creatures, but actually this is a good thing for this deck. So by championing one of our Scarecrows, we actually get that card back and get that ETB another time. So not only do we get to destroy a permanent from Changeling Berserker coming into play, but we get to destroy a permanent whenever it dies too, because another Scarecrow is going to come back into play. There are plenty of other great Changelings, including other ones that champion creatures too. However, since we're on a budget deck, we really had to limit our colors to make sure that we could effectively cast our spells. And again, this deck heavily focuses around artifact synergies and changelings aren't artifact creatures. So we just had to pick the best of the best within the colors that we're focusing on. So there are actually even more ways to get that Scarecrow into the battlefield effect outside of changelings. Let's go through them now in tactic number 7, buy one, get one. First up there's Cackling Counterpart, which is an instant that's going to create a token that's a copy of target creature we control, and we can flash it back for 5 blue blue. And then there's Quasi Duplicate, which does pretty much the exact same thing, but it's a sorcery, and instead of having flashback, it has Jumpstart, so we can cast this card from our graveyard by discarding a card in addition to paying its other costs. So both of these cards in different ways are able to copy a Scarecrow twice. And then there's Mimic Vat, which has whenever a non-token creature dies, you may exile that card. If you do, return each other card exiled with Mimic Vat to its owner's graveyard. And then at any time, you can pay 3 to tap it to create a token that's a copy of a card exiled with it. It gains haste, exile it at the beginning of the next end step. So essentially, whenever one of our Scarecrows dies, we can exile it with Mimic Vat, and then we can pay 3 to create a token of it. This is just a great way for us to get continuous enter the battlefield effects that help us destroy more and more permanents. Speaking of continuous ways to create copies, there's 3 more cards that are great at this in this deck. First up, there's Flame Shadow Conjuring, which says, Whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay red. If you do, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of that creature. That token gains haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next end step. So now whenever we cast one of our Scarecrows, we can just pay an extra red, and if we do, we get to destroy an extra permanent. And next up is Minion Reflector, which pretty much does the exact same thing, but instead of paying a red, we're going to pay 2 mana. And finally, there's Mirror Works, which says, Whenever another non-token artifact enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay 2, if you do create a token that's a copy of that artifact. So this not only works for our Scarecrows, but we can use it on any of our artifacts in this deck. So we've talked about a lot of great cards in this deck, but how do we get to some of those cards more effectively? Let's go through some cards that help us do that in tactic number 8, Drawn to Help. First up there's Frantic Search, which has draw 2 cards, then discard 2 cards, and untap up to 3 lands, so essentially we're casting it for free. And then there's Thirst for Knowledge, which will let us draw 3 cards, but then we have to discard 2 cards unless we discard an artifact card. Again, we're running plenty of artifacts in this deck, so if we need to pitch one of them, we can. And finally there's Paradoxical Outcome, which plays many roles in this deck. It's an instant that says, return any number of target non-land, non-token permanents you control to their owner's hand. Draw a card for each card returned to your hand this way. So first off, this can draw us a ton of cards depending on our board situation. This can also help save any of our permanents that might be in danger from target removal or from wrath effects. And finally, this can actually just help us get our scarecrows back to our hand so that we can recast them and get their enter the battlefield triggers again. What makes this card so great is that we can pick and choose which cards we want to go back to our hand. But we're also going to be running some other cards that help us get some more of those enter the battlefield effects. Let's go through them now in tactic number 9, Gone with the Wind. First up there's Ghostly Flicker, which will let us exile two target artifacts, creatures, and or lands we control, and then return those cards to the battlefield under our control. So this not only can save some of our permanents, but it can also get us some of those enter the battlefield triggers again. And then there's Eerie Interlude, which is a fantastic card for this deck. It's an instant that says, exile any number of target creatures you control, return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So this is not only a great way to save our team from a wrath, but also to get a ton of enter the battlefield triggers all at once. But as good as Eerie Interlude is, it's still just a one-time effect, unlike the Golden Pig of our deck. A quick reminder that the Golden Pig is the number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pig for this deck is Deadeye Navigator. Deadeye Navigator is a 5-5 spirit that costs 4 blue blue. It has Soul Bond, which means you may pair this creature with another unpaired creature when either enters the battlefield. They remain paired for as long as you control both of them. And then it has, as long as Deadeye Navigator is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has pay 1 and a blue, exile this creature, then return to the battlefield under your control. So with Deadeye Navigator Soul Bonded to one of our Scarecrows, we can blink that Scarecrow at any time for just 1 and a blue. And as long as our commander's on the battlefield, that Scarecrow's going to come back into play and destroy a permanent. We can do this as many times as we want, as long as we can pay that 1 and a blue. On top of that, Deadeye Navigator can do a great job at protecting our commander. Even if Deadeye Navigator isn't soul bonded to the Reaper King, we can just blink Deadeye Navigator, and when he comes back in, we can soul bond him to him. And then we just have to pay 1 and a blue to blink our commander to dodge any of that target to removal. This is an incredibly flexible card for this deck, and it can really help us finish out games. And that's why it was named the Golden Pig of the deck. 
So we've talked about our own strategy, which is destroying our opponent's permanence, which already throws a wrench into their plans. But what about some spells that need a more immediate response? Let's go through some cards that help us do that in tactic number 10, Counterpoint. First up, we've got Negate and Unwind, both of which will counter target non-creature spell. On top of that, Unwind is going to let us untap up to three lands, so we basically get to cast it for free. And then there's Arcane Denial, which is going to counter target spell, and its controller may draw up to two cards at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. But there is an upside to this, we also get to draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep too. This deck is a ton of fun and can be very powerful. And it shows that a forgotten tribe like Scarecrows can still make a big impact on a game. But now that we've gone through the cards that help you win with the deck, let's go through the cards that help make it happen. It's time to go on to the mana base. First up is Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap to sacrifice to search our library for a basic land and put into play tapped. Then we're going to be running four of the panoramas with Grixis, Esper, Bant, and Naya. Each of them can either tap for a colorless, or we can pay one to tap and sacrifice them to search our library for up to one of three basic lands and put into play tapped. And next up is Warp Landscape and Terminal Moraine, both of which we can tap for a colorless, or we can pay two to tap and sacrifice them to search our library for a basic land and put into play tapped. Finally, we're going to be running 27 basic lands in this deck, including 19 islands, 4 mountains, 2 plains, 1 swamp, and 1 forest. And now that we've gone through every single card in this deck, let's do a quick price check. A quick reminder that our deck costs are calculated using TCG Player Optimization, optimizing with even heavily played and damaged cards because those cards need a home too. The average Reaper King EDH rec deck is going to set you back $254.89, so let's see how we compare to that. Our deck is going to be much more affordable, coming in at just $24.91. And remember that neither of these deck costs include the commander because this is a commander excluded episode. Again, all Commander's Quarters decks are built to be tuned and focused within their budget, but there are always ways that we can improve on them. Let's go through some reasonable upgrades now to see what some of those ways just might be. First up there's Ghostway, which comes in at $7.98. It's an instant that costs 2 and a white, and it says, remove each creature you control from the game. Return those creatures to play under their owner's control at the end of the turn. This card is very similar to Eerie Interlude and is a great effect for this deck for getting us a ton of Enter the Battlefield triggers at once. And then there's Brago King Eternal, which comes in at $2.31. Brago is a 2-4 spirit with flying that costs 2 white blue. It has whenever Brago King Eternal deals combat damage to a player, exile any number of target non-land permanents you control and then return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. This is just an incredible repeatable effect that will help us get a ton of Scarecrow enter the battlefield triggers each turn. And next up there's Panharmonicon, which comes in at $6.34. Panharmonicon is an artifact that costs 4 and it says if an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So with this and our commander in play, anytime a scarecrow enters the battlefield, it's going to destroy two permanents instead of one. And then there's Blade of Cells, which comes in at $5.02. It's an equipment that costs two and it costs four to equip. It's going to give the equipped creature Myriad, which means whenever it attacks for each opponent other than a defending player, you may create a token that's a copy of that creature that's tapped in attacking that player or planeswalker they control. Exile the tokens at the end of combat. When we have this equipped to Reaper King and it attacks, it's going to create three new tokens of Reaper King. When each of those comes into play, they're going to see each other and destroy a ton of permanents. Next up is Helm of the Host, which comes in at $2.95. Helm of the Host is a legendary equipment that costs 4 and it costs 5 to equip. It says at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a token that's a copy of equipped creature, except that that token isn't legendary if equipped creature is legendary. The token gains haste. With just a few turns with this attached to the Reaper King, it gets out of control very quickly. And finally, there's Rite of Replication, which comes in at $4.09. It's a sorcery that costs 2 blue blue, but it does have kicker 5. It says, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of target creature. If it was kicked, though, put 5 of those tokens onto the battlefield instead. So if we kick it and we target Reaper King, we're going to create 5 copies of it. When all these come into play and see each other, we get to destroy 25 permanents. In most cases, this is pretty much just game over for our opponents. And with that, our show is coming to a close, but I really just want to hear about what you guys think about this deck, so why don't you let me know in the comments below. When you're buying decks like this one, or just individual cards, make sure you use that decklist link in the description below. Because not only will you get great prices on TCG Player, but you're also going to be supporting this show because they sponsor us. And make sure you follow us on social media so you can get some early hints on who the next commander just might be. Links to our social media accounts can be found in the description. Also in the description, you'll find a link to the Commander's Quarters Patreon page, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the patrons who've subscribed so far. There are many benefits to being a patron for the Commander's Quarters, including being able to vote on future commanders for deck techs. There's even a general tier where you get your own personalized deck tech dedicated to you. I truly couldn't do this without all of your support, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel and check out some of our other videos on budget deck techs, commander excluded deck techs, and super budget episodes. And with that, I'm out of here. Thanks again and have a good one.